Hello everyone. It's been a while again. I'm sorry for not doing the videos on a more regular basis like I've been saying I would try to do. Life's been a, a bit stressful for me and busy, but I have been in preparation stages for some big aspects of my projects. And I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on what's going on. So basically, I have been buying a good number of books for my research purposes. And the, w the way I'm focusing my research is I'm focusing on ancient literature that parallels the Bible. Like, for example, Sumerian literature, uh, Akkadian literature, which is also known as Babylonian and Assyrian. Those were two dialects of the language known as Akkadian. And these ancient languages represent a window into the past, in basically into the world of the Bible. The, these writings have so many similar stories to the writings of the Bible. The languages of Mesopotamia, the region of Mesopotamia, the ancient Mesopotamia, uh, and the ancient Semitic people. They had a, a striking similarity of content in many of their stories, as well as large overlap in mythology. Now, a lot of scholars, well, pretty much most scholars, will dismiss mythology as legendary as as fake my vantage point is that mythology is based largely on truth not everything of course in mythology is accurate you have to compare different sources and there's there's not uh, not all mythology is in agreement there's contradictions between the different mythologies but there's a striking harmony between all the different mythologies of the different regions and there, it suggests a common origin of mythology. Like, for example, the Greek mythology, you know, pretty f that, that's pretty popular mythology, where it has all those deities, all those gods, the Greek gods, and all those mythological creatures, the, the hybrids, the crazy creatures. Well, these stories, I contend, were not just made up but are based on reality, because, as we know from the Bible, there, something very similar happened, where the watchers descended, they reproduced, had offspring with humans and animals as well, and they created these hybrid monsters, the same exact type of monsters that we see in the Greek mythology. And, uh, and these angels, these watchers, have the qualities and characteristics of the deities, of the gods, of Greek mythology. Now, there's not a perfect correspondence between the, the two different stories, but there's so many similarities that there has to be a common origin. And upon further study, I have noticed that, the, that scholars seem to be leaning towards the understanding that Greek mythology derives out of out of a, in, in many ways, derives a lot of their stories from, from a Semitic mythology or Mesopotamian mythology. So that's very important because it seems like so much of the various regions' mythology are interconnected. And so I have come to the conclusion earlier this year of some pretty controversial things, but I'm pretty, fairly confident on these things. And I wanna I'm going to make videos in the future demonstrating these things, because I don't want you guys to just take my word for things I say, especially things that are more controversial, like these type of topics. But I have come to the conclusion that many different religions worship the same the same God that we do under a different name. 
and they associate strange stories sometimes to the god. Uh, so, so for example, uh, so you know in the Bible there's the the the, the main three, the main three uh, gods, if you will, the 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 Father of all, the Most High. Then you have the Holy Spirit, which is basically like the mother, the ultimate mother, right? And then you have the ultimate son, which is basically the representative and appointed as chief of all the other gods, all the other sons of God, the sons of Elohim. These other beings have one at their chief head, and that would be Yahweh, or in the Canaanite understanding, Baal. So Baal, Yahweh, is the head of the sons of the father and the mother. And we see similar concepts in the other mythologies. You have, you have a father, a mother, and you have the children. And so, basically, for example, I think Zeus is identical with Yahweh. That's a controversial idea. But I think you have to remember that Yahweh is a Hebrew word. So in other languages that are not Hebrew, they're not going to have that word. They're going to have a different word. So it's actually pretty illogical to think that other people who are worshipping the same God would use the same words. Uh, because they have a different language. Their language was uh, dispersed at the Tower of Babel. So it actually makes sense that they have a completely different word for it. That's why um, I think also, for example, you'll have uh, Edom. The Edomites, they called the chief god uh, instead of Yahweh, they said Kus. And, and um, so there, there, there were different names in, in different mythologies for that chief deity. But it seems like, from what I can tell, the striking similarities of this same god in all the different mythologies indicates that it is the same god. It's not different, different deities. People can get very divisive over perceived differences of people worshipping different gods. Like, one of the biggest ones that I think is completely ridiculous is the notion that Allah, the Muslim version of God, is a different god than Yahweh. It is preposterous to me because there are so many identical things between the god of Islam and the God of the Bible, especially the version of God from the Old Testament. You might argue from the Christian perspective that the God of the Bible is completely different than the God of Islam, but if you remember that there is the Old Testament version of God in the God Bible, the Bible God, so many of the things that Christians find abhorrent about the Muslim God are the same exact qualities and character traits as the God of the Bible. So, when you realize that, the arguments ag uh, against them being the same God start to vanish and go away. And suddenly, there it is before your eyes. They are the same being. So, Muslims do, in fact, worship the same God. It's just they have a different understanding of some aspects of who, who God is, what God has done. But think about it like this, like... Uh, Many people know me as a person, right? I have some great friends. My friend, some people really look up to me and value my teachings and, and look up to me as a source of wisdom and look to me as their teacher. Other people think I am insane, I am psychotic, I, I am demonic, and all kinds of horrible things. And my family is more in the middle where they view me as kind of 
off the path, you know, off the deep end, but not necessarily psychotic, but just kind of deceived and foolish and ignorant, those type of things. So anyways, you have three different, very different conceptions of me as a person. But it's very clear that everybody is talking about the same person, me. Everyone's, everyone knows that I am the same person. They're using radically different understanding of my character and who I am as a person, and they can't all be right. So clearly some of them are falsely representing me and who I am, but they are, in fact, referring to me. In the same exact way, Muslims and Christians and Jews are all referring to the same exact God, even though their understanding of some of <clears throat> the theology of what God is like and what he has done and what he plans to do, that differs. But it doesn't mean they are different beings. They're all they, we know that they're all talking about the same being. That's that's how we know. It's okay, so with that being said, that's what has been drawing me to this to these other ancient mythologies. The fact that they're all worshiping the same gods as the gods of the Bible. A controversial thing that I've been discovering is that the Bible teaches that there are other gods, not but that we are not to worship these other gods. That's an important distinction. Kind of like, in a similar way, of how there are tons of kings, there are tons of rulers. You know, there's a, almost 200 countries in the world, which means there are basically 200 kings in the world, right? But most of those kings, most of those countries are not my country. They're not my king. So I don't... I don't have to submit to their authority because they're not king. They're not my king. They are kings, but not my king. Uh, I'm part of the United States of America, so the president of the United States, Donald Trump, <coughs> excuse me, currently, he's the leader. So he's my leader in the in the government sense. He's my king, but he won't. He pro he may not be for long. Someone else will probably may be voted in to replace him. Uh, but the fact is, none of these other countries, their leaders are not my authority. They're not over me in any way, shape, or form. So, uh, in the same way, the Bible actually is very clear that there are many, many gods that are real gods. They're not just fake gods. They're real. Okay, And these real gods are angels, essentially. But again, it's not just another word for angels. They are actually gods. But it's our, defini our definition of God is a little distorted. We kind of define a God as worthy to be worshipped or whatever. But the reality is it's like it's very similar to a king where they are appointed as power over something. So you have the god of the ocean, the god of the sun, the god of the moon. What is the god of the sun's role? The God of the Sun is designed by God, is given the role to rule over the Sun, tell the Sun what he needs to do to fulfill his his purpose, and guides the Sun across across the uh, across the heavens for the orbit, the cycle, the sun has a cycle that it has to follow every day in obedience to the God's commandments but the sun needs help to fulfill the requirements so the sun God is the angel who is appointed by God to help the sun fulfill its purpose by guiding him showing him the way so that's what these angels from the Bible understanding that's what these angels were appointed to do. And then, over time, people started worshipping these angels when they weren't supposed to. They were not supposed to worship these angels. They weren't supposed to pray to them, make sacrifices to them, uh, treat them as their kings, their authority. So, that's the key distinction here. That's why people of the Bible were so deceived into worshiping other gods, because there are other gods. 
And it's very tempting when there are other gods to worship those other gods if they have done something impressive. So, and I do want to get more into that in another top, to another, at another time. There's just so much to go into that that I don't want to touch upon it right now because, uh, I mean, I don't want to really dive deep into that subject because of how controversial it is and how massive it would be to try to demonstrate the concepts because there's so much evidence but it excuse me huh. so much evidence but you have to go through all of it and it takes time so I'm working on that I'm, I'm trying to study the different languages but uh, in the different writings but so the key but if you if you kind of say to yourself, well, I don't, I'm not comfortable with Greek mythology. You know, you shouldn't be studying Greek mythology. Someone might be saying, and I'll say, okay, let's just say maybe you're right. Like maybe we shouldn't be studying these other mythologies because they're so far removed from the Hebrew, right? Well, there is, there are two mythologies very close to the Bible that I believe we should be studying, and those are uh, the Canaanite mythology. And the Akkadian mythology. The Canaanite one is the is the closest and most important in agreement with the Bible's mythology. It's basically the exact same mythology, and that mythology can be found in the writings of Ugarit from the language scholars call Ugaritic. It is a what's called a Semitic language, but it's so close to Hebrew it could almost be considered a dialect of Hebrew. Or Hebrew and Ugaritic are both dialects of a parent language. Uh, Proto-Canaanite, you could call it. So basically, when you study those writings, you, you see, like, in the writings it talks about 70 sons of, of El. And El, we know, is the Most High. The Most High God, El. Then there's also the 70 sons of Asherah. Asherah is the feminine aspect of God. That would be the Holy Spirit or the Mother. So you have El and the 70 sons of El. You have Asherah and the 70 sons of Asherah, which is mentioned in the Ugarit writings. You have the Book of Enoch, which says that there were the 70 shepherds, angel shepherds appointed over the nations. And you have that same concept from the Bible, from Deuteronomy, which states that the nations were uh, appointed lots and the angels were assigned to the different nations, but Israel was assigned to Yahweh. So you have the chief over the nations or over Israel that's Yahweh or Baal and then you have the other nations the 70 nations which have their own shepherds their own angels their own gods assigned to each to each nation and so uh, the, the similarity there is, cannot be coincidence the 70 the number 70 fact that the Ugaric writings have 70 sons of El, 70 sons of Asherah, and Enoch has the 70 shepherds over the nations, and Deuteronomy has, uh, or the Torah, the Law of Moses, has the 70 nations in which each angel is appointed over the nations, the Gentile nations. So, um, that's just one of the biggest ones, but there's so many other striking correspondences between what the Bible says and what the Canaanite writings say, the Ugaritic writings, that it's unmistakable that it is clear that the mythology is the same. So we need to study the mythology of the Canaanites because their mythology will reveal to us the true mythology of the Bible. And this is something important because it's kind of like, why why um, should we defend the honor of the righteous? Or the, the, or the 
the people of the past. I, I think we should defend the integrity, even of, of the unrighteous sometimes, because people misrepresent the unrighteous as being worse than they actually were. So we should defend we should defend those who are falsely accused, even if they are wicked. We, we should defend all from false accusations. And especially the major figures of the historical past, especially the figures of important biblical notoriety, we should defend their honor. And I think it's important to defend the honor of the gods, of the angels. It's important to defend their honor. But not to worship them in, in, you know, we're not supposed to bow down to them, pray to them, you know, but we are to honor them in a way. Uh, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a fuzzy line sometimes. You, you have to be very careful. You don't want to uh, go over into sinful worship. Because the, you know the the punishment for that is death in the Bible, the law of Moses. If you're worshiping other gods, it's considered a capital offense. On the other hand, we're supposed to honor the angels. We're supposed to respect them, who they are. So, um, yeah. So that that's the importance of what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. Because the Bible has so much of this stuff at its core roots. So if I want to reconstruct the Bible properly and accurately, which I do, then I need to understand the background of the Bible. I need to understand the historical context. And the readers, the, the people who want to interpret the Bible properly, which should be everyone, need to understand the historical context. Not everybody has the time to wade through all this massive amount of literature. And learn these languages, right? It's not reasonable or fair to expect everybody to reach that level of knowledge. But when it's available, what's available to you, you if you're able to know it, then you're accountable to it. So my goal is to try to take all this massive amount of knowledge, synthesize it, and present it for people in a short, short uh an easier way to digest for people that doesn't require them to, to spend so much amount of their time in their lives learning this stuff. So that's really what my plan is. I'm studying a lot of basic concepts of these ancient writings. I'm com I'm looking at similarities, and I'm every every week I'm seeing new amazing things that are striking correspondences of the ancient cultures surrounding the Bible and how it strikingly lines up. So in my plans for making my version of the Bible, I want to be adequately informed before I tackle this very huge uh, project, uh, before I actually begin the translation process. So right now, I have decided the most important approach, way to approach it is to learn the basic Semitic languages. Some I want to be actually fluent in, others I want to just have a, a basic understanding of their grammar and also wade through their vocabulary, uh, but not necessarily be fluent in the language. So um, what I'm working on now is going through the lexicons of the Hebrew. I'm specifically focusing on the Hebrew Bible and for, for starters, the Tanakh. Then I'm going to incorporate some of the Dead Sea Scroll vocabulary and some other vocabulary that's outside of the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm going to look at that vocabulary, compile it into my own personal dictionary, possibly provide it to other people if I feel confident enough in the accuracy of my dictionary that I have pre prepared. But then I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to do a, a dictionary of Aramaic as well. A dictionary of uh, Arabic. Eventually Ethiopic. But Ethiopic is of a lesser importance for me. 
because of how obscure it is in the grand scheme of things. The most important languages for Bible translation purposes are Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Those are the main core languages. But I'm also going to try to learn uh, Akkadian and Ugaritic. I think those are key that I need to learn enough about them at least. Maybe not speak them to people. It would be hard to find someone to speak with them anyway. But I really want to dive into those ancient languages because they have so much so much uh, of relevance that it is truly mind-boggling and it definitely needs to be tapped into. And it can help reveal many truths of the Bible if we look into these other languages, look into these other writings of the past cultures. And so I'm working on that lexicon and once I have gone through enough of the words and I feel confident enough, I'm going to start the translation process. But I also, because the Septuagint is so important, I really feel like I need to learn fluently the Greek language, at least fluently read it. And the same thing with Latin. I think I think the core languages I need, I need to learn Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Those are, uh, without exception, I need to learn those. Once I learn those languages, then is when I'm going to start the translation process. So it's going to be a while. It's going to be some years, probably, before I actually start the translation. But I am learning, and as I'm learning, I'm going to be sharing with you guys. And I'm considering the possibility of, of uh, starting a regular series to share with you guys what I'm learning. That way you're not left for a long time without knowing anything that I'm discovering. So if I can maybe make some videos and possibly have a website where I post articles or blog posts, that would be something that really good to, to share with you guys. So uh, that's, that's uh, kind of the overview. That's kind of my plan right now. I'm just, as I said I'm, before, I'm buying lots of books for this pr these purposes. I'm also finding a lot of these books online for free. So, but... Uh, I know it's frustrating how long this project is going to be taking, but once it gets going, once it starts, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pass by quicker. So I just want you guys to be patient with me, and we'll, we're going we're gonna to see some amazing stuff from this project, I promise. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a game changer. It's going to open people's eyes, I believe. But I don't want to start working on it prematurely. Because of how important this is, I need to do it properly. So I need to learn the languages uh, fully. Obviously, you know, I don't need to be the best expert on the language in the whole world, not necessarily like that, but I want to be able to be fluent in it, to actually think in the language and, and look at a passage right away and know what it says like that, just like I do in English. I want it to be natural flowing to me. So that's going to take some time, obviously. But I do believe if I put in the effort consistently, I will get there. So hang on tight. And if you guys have any questions or topics you want me to talk about, send me a message, comment, or contact me my email. Uh, if you don't know my email, just ask me in a comment what's my email, and I'll, and I'll let you know. But yeah, so, and if you support my project and you want to support uh, financially, that's always an option too. Just let me know with that as well. There's different ways to do that. I through Facebook, through email, and any basically any way you want to send money is fine. Or if you want to buy books for my project, that would be great. People have done that in the past, but you don't need to feel obliged to do that. I am buying a lot of the books myself. I have spent thousands of dollars on on these books, but there are so many more books that need to be bought for this project, which I will buy eventually. But you can help with that if you want. If you feel called to, that's fine. 
If not, I encourage prayers. That's always helpful. And anyways, that's it. I don't want to make this video go on any longer. So uh, thank you guys for following my work. And I really apologize for just not being consistent in releasing videos. I really, really want to try to be better about that in this new year, 2020, that's coming up. So um, I'm looking forward to giving you guys more content that will inspire you. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week and shalom.